Hey there, welcome back. This is Kevin Shanahan for Magnus Sociology. This is Chapter 17, Collective Behavior and Social Change. We're going to talk about the uh, next two sections. Uh, why Social Movements Matter will be our case study. And Section 1 will be on collective behavior. And Section 2 will be on social movements. So why do social movements matter? Well, social movements crest and wane while experiencing both successes and failures. The civil rights movement, for example, in the United States is one good example. In the 1950s and 60s, African Americans and anti-segregationists fought for equal treatment and urged Congress to pass new protections for minorities. While these efforts resulted in dramatic changes, African Americans still experienced discrimination in several areas throughout the country. So section one, at a glance, collective behavior. Collective behavior is the relatively spontaneous social behavior that occurs when people try to develop common solutions to unclear situations. It can be divided into three broad categories, crowds, collectives, preoccupation, and public opinion. Explanations offered for collective behavior include the contagion theory, the emergent norm theory, and the value added theory. Collective behavior is divided into three broad categories towards crowds, collective preoccupations, and public opinion. Sociologists offer three explanations for collective behavior, contagion theory, emergent norm theory, and value added theory. So at the end of this section, you should be able to answer, how do sociologists define collective behavior? What kind of collective behavior do crowds exhibit? And what do collective preoccupations involve? How do politicians, businesses, and interest groups try to influence public opinion? And then what theories have been offered to explain collective behavior? The relatively spontaneous social behavior that occurs when people try to develop common solutions to unclear situations. Difficult, they're difficult to study. The types of collective behavior are numerous and behavior <coughs> Behavior involves many people who do not know each other. Collective behavior is an enduring aspect of society. Collectivities are groups that exhibit collective behavior. Collectivities include crowds, mobs, riots, panics, mass hysteria, crazes, fashions, fads, rumors, urban legends, and public opinion. So of the groups, we members interact directly upon, uh, often for long periods of time. Members share clearly defined and widely understood norms. And members are united by an awareness of belonging to the group. Collectivities, on the other hand, members rarely, if ever, interact directly. Members do not share clearly defined conventional norms. And members rarely share a sense of group unity. So how do collectivities differ from groups? In contrast to social groups, individuals and collectivities have limited interaction with one another. They do not share defined or conventional norms. And they do not share a sense of group unity. Crowds. Types of crowds. A crowd is a temporary gathering of people who are in a close enough proximity to interact. Types of crowds include the following, the casual crowd. This crowd forms because some event captures people's attention, least organized and most temporary type of crowd. This example might be uh, a group of people waiting in line for movie tickets or concert tickets or whatever kind of tickets. Uh, just a group of people that are waiting around. Uh, then the conventional crowd is more structured not much interaction, but people act according to a set of rules. 
example of this would be people gathered for a public lecture. So as you wait about for the beginning of the basketball game or something like that. Uh, types of crowds continued. Expressive crowds have no apparent goal or purpose. Uh, they form around an emotionally charged event like the uh, rock concert. So you're just a big crowd of people and uh, you know, you're you're excited because of the event, um, like at a game or a concert. Uh, an acting crowd is a violent group of people formed because of hostile and destructive emotion. So an acting crowd would be like when people are looting in a riot or after a natural disaster or something like that. Um, I threw a bunch of money in the atrium, everybody would crowd around to gather up the money. Uh, the protest crowd exhibits characteristics of the acting crowd, but they're better organized and longer lasting. So people protesting a political con at a political convention, for example, would be a protest crowd. Anytime that we have a protest uh, where we're Together, there isn't necessarily a defined set of rules, but we are following a basic set of rules. So here's our crowds that Herbert Bloomer identified. There are four stages in the development of an acting crowd. Uh, exciting milling behavior is a common object and the common impulse of the fanatic supporters. He uses European soccer teams to provide a vivid illustration of this process. Identify other acting crowd and describe hip follows these four stages. So the acting crowd, first you have your exciting event. Acting your crowds are triggered by an exciting event for the fan, fanatics soccer crowd. The exciting event is the game itself. The day, the day of the game approaches, the event takes on such importance in the minds of the supporters that they become completely preoccupied with it. Second, they have milling behavior. Hours before the game starts, supporters mill around talking about it. As they talk, they develop ideas and how they should think and feel and act. As more supporters join the crowd, these ideas are reinforced. With the game drawing ever closer, the milling crowd becomes more agitated. Then you would have the common object, step three. In the common object during the game, crowd members get caught up in the collective excitement, becoming fixated on some excitement and some aspect of the event. Perhaps their team is playing badly and opposing supporters are taunting them, or conversely, their team is winning and they taunt the opposition. Then four, the fourth step is the common impulse, at some point during the game, the crowd members begin to sense they agree on what action to take common impulse to attack opposing supporters, uh, perhaps is simulated and intensified by a sense of excitement. That spreads through the crowd like a contagion or disease. The acting crowd, this social contagion results in the loss of the individual control and abandonment of the accepted social norms. The infected individuals act on the common impulse, such hence the word acting. The common impulse simul spontaneously. The violent behavior tends to continue until the police come in and regain control. Mobs and riots. Mobs. Mobs are emotionally charged collectivities whose members are united by a specific destructive or violent goal. They usually have leaders who urge the crowd towards common action. Riots are collections of people who erupt into the destructive behavior. They're less unified than mobs. Panics. Panic spontaneous uncoordinated group actions to escape some, some perceived threat. Mutual cooperation breaks down. It often occurs in, in situations outside the realm of everyday experience. Mass hysteria. It's unfounded anxiety shared by people who can be scattered over a wide geographic area and involves irrational beliefs and is usually short-lived. So what types of collective behavior 
result from violence and fear, mob, panic, and mass hysteria. Collective preoccupations. Even people who rarely meet, let alone interact, engage in similar behavior and share an understanding of the meaning of that behavior. Examples are fashions, fads, rumors, and urban legends. Fashions are attachments to particular styles or, or of appearance. Fads are unconventional objects, actions, or ideas that a large number of people are attached to for a short period of time. So the fashion might be long or short haircuts, wearing your hair in curls or uh, in braids. Uh, those are all different fashions that come and go periodically, beards and mustaches. Fads, however, are, are more unconventional. Back in the uh, 1970s, there was a fad where people used to collect pet rocks. Every hat buddy had to run out and buy a pet rock. And, uh, and of course, that didn't last very long and eventually went away. Rumors and urban legends. Rumors are unverified pieces of information that are spread from one person to another. In 2016, there was a rumor that Hillary Clinton was part of a major pedophile ring at a, where they held children prisoner in the basement of a pizza place. And a guy from North Carolina went up there to uh, free the children. And uh, he raided the pizza place with the AR-15. Uh, and it turns out the pizza place didn't even have a basement. And Hillary Clinton had never been there. Uh, urban legends are stories that teach a lesson and seem to be uh, realistic, but are untrue. Uh, you may be familiar with the famous urban legend of the couple goes parking uh, in, uh, and uh, they hear a scratching noise and they're afraid of the, of the uh, attacker who's famous for having a hook and, and, and killing uh, couples. So they, they flee the scene and when they get home, they find the hook hanging off the door of the car. Uh, it's not a true story, but it's an urban legend, but it also, you know, it, it emphasizes the point that it's dangerous for couples to go parking. Uh, what are collective preoccupations and how do they spread? Collective preoccupations involve people who rarely meet, yet they engage in a similar behavior through participating in similar fads or fashion or taking part in the spread of the same rumor or urban legend. Uh, collective behavior is relatively spontaneous social behavior that occurs when people try to develop common solutions to unclear situations. There are three broad categories of collective behavior, crowds, collective preoccupations, and public opinion. Crowds, a crowd is a temporary gathering of people who are close enough in proximity to interact. This crowd is responding to the emotionally charged atmosphere of a rock concert. Collective preoccupation involves people who exhibit similar behavior and share under standings of what the behavior means. Fashions such as the black clothing of the goth subculture are a form of collective preoccupation. Public opinion refers to the differing attitudes that the public has about the issues, and sometimes the viewing public is asked to express its opinion on participants in television talent contests by casting votes, for instance. Public opinion is the collection of differing attitudes that members of a public have about a particular issue, and it, public opinion is subject to rapid change. People seeking elected office pay much attention to public opinion, and so they do all kinds of opinion polling before elections. Pol Politicians, interest groups, and businesses pay billions of dollars to influence the public opinion. And they use seven types of propaganda or advertising. They use testimonials. Testimonials is when you get someone famous, like an athlete or an actor or some other celebrity, to uh, promote your product or idea. 
Uh, transfer is similar to testimonial that it attempts to associate a product or a candidate or an idea with something that the public approves of or respects. For example, advertisers might display their product with national symbols, such as the flag and historic monuments, suggesting that buying the product is patriotic, sort of like uh, when you see the uh, Budweiser commercials and the American flag is always in it and the horses and all the, the Clydesdales. Uh, the bandwagon technique appeals to the public's desire to conform. For example, a politician or product may be promoted as the one already most popular with the public. Uh, oftentimes you see this like with sports team. When a team is winning, everybody joins that it all suddenly becomes a fan. That's the bandwagon technique. Uh, you know, don't be left behind. Be with, be with the winner. Uh, the name calling technique refers to negative labels or images in order to make competitors appear in an unfavorable light. You see this a lot in political campaigns. Uh, politicians may accuse their opponents of being reckless spenders or uncaring about the needs of the public. The aim of this technique is to persuade the public to associate the politician or the product with an unfavorable label. Uh, the plain folks appeal attempts to sway public opinion by appealing to the average American. Thus, a politician may portray, be portrayed as a plain, hard-working American. For years and years, they tried to always say that he was a log cabin um, born in a log cabin kind of thing to uh, uh, to emphasize the, uh, the frontier roots of our presidents. That kind of thing was a real common thing. Make it just plain folks. I'm a working man. Uh, the glittering generality is a technique that refers to the use of words and sound positive but have little meaning. And you'll see this oftentimes with the politician will talk, say a whole lot of nothing. And you know, um, where they they wrap themselves in the American flag and they talk about patriotic things, but they don't really say anything one way or the other. As long as it sounds positive and it provides little information about the, the, the politician's views. And then finally, we have card stacking. Card stacking is a practice of presenting facts in the way that places politicians or products in a favorable light. For example, newspapers may give a great deal of attention to politicians they favor and little attention to those they oppose. And uh, Donald Trump was real famous for that, complaining that CNN was uh, is opposes him, but Fox News is the only real no, you know, good news station because when he was president, the uh, uh, Fox News tended to. Uh, favor him. So identify what techniques are used to sway public opinion. Well, we just talked about them. So what are they? That's right. They're testimonials, transfer technique, bandwagon, name calling, plain folks, glittering generalities, and card stacking. So what I want you to do now is to create your own advertisement. How do the, uh, so we're going to explore the idea, how do advertisers uh, use propaganda to sway public opinion? So I want you to come up with an imaginary product that is being introduced here at your school. And it could be a new course, a new item a, for the cafeteria menu or a candidate for the student council. Use one of the seven propaganda techniques, the testimonial, the transfer, the bandwagon, name calling, plain folks appeal, glittering generalities, or card stacking to create an advertisement to sell the product to your classmates. Then I want you to share your advertisement here with the class, discuss why you chose to use the technique that you did, and was it the most effective technique for your product? How would your advertisement have been different if you had chosen another technique? As a class, select most effective advertisements. Discuss what makes them the most effective. What propaganda technique do, you, do your selected advertisements employ? Now, we're going to talk about uh, 
how to explain collective behavior, we're going to talk about the contagion theory. So the contagion theory is a hypnotic power of a crowd encourages people to give their individuality to the stronger pull of the group. A crowd offers anonymity and overtakes a member with emotions and makes members suggestible. People who are often faced with the situation in which traditional norms and behaviors do not apply, as a result, new norms gradually emerge. Another form of uh, is value-added theory. Uh, here we identify steps that are taken as a result of the collective behavior. Six conditions result in that collective behavior. We have structural conduciveness, structural strain, growth, spread of generalized belief, precipitating factors, and mobilization for action and social control. So how do these three theories differ and how do they explain collective behavior? Contagion theory is the hypnotic power of a, a crowd and encourages people to bend to the collective mind of the crowd. Uh, this is a case where oftentimes, you know, people will do things that they would not normally do. Uh, emergent norm theory is when faced with no clear standards for behavior, people in the crowd conform to a new set of norms. So, for instance, when you find yourself in a brand new situation with a group of people who are experiencing something for the first time, you uh, will develop a set of norms on what you, as a group, you'll kind of develop uh, based on how to behave. Uh, collective behavior develops and narrows as each value is added to it. So, for instance, so although, uh, when we responding to terrorism, although deeply shocked to terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, Americans quickly came together as a collective response. Since the attacks, however, opinions have uh, changed dr dramatically. Our early response uh, after September 11th was that we were shocked and anger for the attack on the Twin Towers in the uh, Pentagon. Uh, people became uh, very anxious. Uh, there was all kinds of uh, theories about terrorists roaming the country, poisoning the water supply, and doing all kinds of things like that. Many felt a sense of unity as a result of this. And so when we decided to attack Afghanistan, where Al-Qaeda was headquartered at, we saw this. there was a great deal of support for the war. Later on, we attacked Iraq. Uh, and by then, uh, uh, just a few years later, uh, people had begun to question whether we were in it for the right reasons. Uh, as the war uh, continued, it started to lose support, uh, and by 2008, the war was very unpopular. Uh, half saw the war as a stalemate in Iraq because of all the uh, fighting that was going on, and many stated that the nation was not prepared to prevent another attack. Because the war had gone so poorly in Iraq at that point that... Uh, uh, people felt like we were still quite a bit in danger. So how have American attitudes on the war of terror changed? Uh, they changed dramatically over time. Uh, first from very enthusiastic to later to being opposed. Do you think the changes in the United States since 9-11 have been positive or negative? Tell me why. All right, let's talk about section two, social movements. A social movement is a long-term conscious effort to promote and prevent social change. Sociologists have identified four stages in the life cycle of a social movement. Agitation, legitimation, bureaucratization, and institutionalization. Explanations for the development of the social movements include relative deprivation theory and resource mobilization theory. Our main idea is a social movement is a long-term conscious effort to promote or prevent social chain. Sociologists have identified four stages in the life cycle of social movements, agitation, legitima legitimation, bureaucratization, and institutionalization. 
So when you're finished with this section, you should be able to explain what types of social movements exist and how do they differ? What are the stages of the life cycle social movements and how do sociologists explain the existence of a social movement? Social change are alterations in various aspects of society over time. Social movements are long-term conscious efforts to promote or prevent social change. Long-lasting, social movements are long-lasting, they're highly structured, organization with formally recognized leaders, a deliberate attempt to institute or block societal change. Uh, they can attract members in the millions and four types based on the level of change sought. First off, there's the reactionary movement. The reactionary movement goal is to reverse current social trends. Members are suspicious of any of and hostile towards social change and are often violent. Um, for instance, uh, the Ku Klux Klan is a good example of a reactionary movement. The Ku Klux Klan was developed to try to keep uh, African-American people in a subservient role in Southern society uh, because of the Civil War. Um, that was no longer the case. And so they emerged uh, to try to turn the clock back to pre-Civil War. And uh, they often used violence to uh, force uh, African-American people to uh, comply with their wishes. Whoops, what happened? Conservative movements. The goal is to protect what they see as society's prevailing values from changes that they consider to be the threat to those values. So conservative movements, uh, in the 1970s, there was a movement for women to gain equal rights uh, and uh, um, it was called the Equal Rights Amendment, and uh, these women were having great success. And a woman by the name of Phyllis Schlafly came along and um, started working against the Equal Rights Amendment and actually prevented it from getting passed. And as a result, her, uh, uh, her group was able, it was a conservative movement that kept uh, the threat to uh, the traditional values of uh, um, patriarchy in place and kept the women's movement for rising up. Visionary, revisionary movements, the goal is to improve or revise some part of society through social change. They use legal channels and focus on a single issue. And so we see revisionary movements like the uh, NAACP would be uh, a good example Uh, a good example of that because of uh, their efforts to take uh, slow, careful, and legal measures to advance the cause of uh, rights for uh, African Americans and minorities. And then there are revolutionary movements. Of course, the uh, French Revolution or the American Revolution are uh, good examples of revolutionary movements. The goal is a total and radical change of the existing social structure where they overthrow all the current order and they uh, try to switch things. Oftentimes revolutionary movements become violent and, and oftentimes use illegal activities as a way to invoke their change. So how do the four types of social movements differ in terms of level of social change they seek? Uh, reactionary, Movements try to reverse current social trends to a time pre uh, previously. Conservative movements try to protect what they see as the way things should be er, and have always been and should not remain. Uh, uh, revisionary movements try to improve society slowly and carefully, but uh, they too are a, kind of a middle of the road. and. Uh, radical change uh, is the revolutionary side of it in which things are dramatic as far as change goes. 
So the life cycle of a social movement, agitation emerge out of the belief that a problem exists, that solutions need to be found. It begins with a small group with a strong commitment and sometimes seen as cranks. Oftentimes these are seen as those wild people. Legitimation is the movement to find support. It becomes respectable. Leaders are seen as spokespeople of a just cause. And at this stage, the media gives it attention. Bureaucratization occurs as the organizational structure of the movement becomes more formal, has ranked structure, official policies and strategies for the future, and original goals are sometimes lost. And then institutionalization is the final stage. It occurs when the movement has become established part of society. The movement resists proposals for change and membership then begins to dwindle and eventually disappear. So the life cycle of the labor movement. The American labor movement, which is its beginnings in the late 1800s, provides an illustration of the life cycle of a social movement. Agitation, with, uh, in the 1800s, they had low pay and harsh working conditions, led many workers to seek support of unions that would protect, protect their employee interests. Um, over time, they became legitimate uh, after years of fighting, in fact, uh, during the agitation phase, they, oftentimes they led to gun battles with the government and the owners of the companies. Legitimation, uh, after many years of often violent confrontations between workers and management, and after years of resistance from many segments of the population, labor unions received official governmental recognition. And so this is what takes place in the 1930s in the labor movement. Uh, there's some violent strikes and things like that, but after the 1930s, things kind of fall into order. During bureaucratization phase over the years, the labor unions grew in size and number, and today are, they are firmly established from powerful organizations. This took place in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And then institutionalization, uh, labor unions are now so well established in society that they resist attempts to change their operating procedures, even though many of these procedures may not benefit the membership and some members feeling the labor unions no longer serve their needs and begin to leave. And this kind of what happened in the 1970s and 80s. And by the, uh, after Ronald Reagan came in 1980, he uh, started to dismantle the labor movement, and as a result, labor movement, labor unions no longer have much of an influence. Uh, they are still influential, but not to the great extent that they used to be. So what are the stages of the life cycle of a social movement? Agitation, legitimation, bureaucratization, and institutionalization. Early theories labeled social movements as the product of psychologically disturbed people. Sociologists, however, see problems in the social structure as the cause. Relative deprivation theory suggests that movements arise when a group of people feel economically or socially deprived compared to what other groups have. People seek things that others have not, have, and they do not. Resource mobilization theory, the organization and effective use of resources results in the acceptance of the group's goal, the needs, supporters, resources, and access to the media. And some sociologists say both theories are accurate descriptions of the rise of social movements. Two leading explanations of the social movements are relative deprivation theory and resource mobilization theory. So what are these two major sociological theories on the development of social movements? Relative deprivation theory, where social movements arise when large numbers of people feel economically or socially deprived. And then there's resource mobilization theory where resources, including the body of supporters, financial resources and access to the media are necessary for a successful social movement. So let's create a, uh, a social movement. 
What methods can be used to attract support of a social movement? In this simulation, you will review collective behavior and social movements. Think of an ideology that would turn into a social movement. Work in a group to publicize your social movement using a website. After reviewing the information in this chapter, think of a social movement to promote. Find answers to three questions. What is our ideology of our social movement? Which type of social movement do we represent? And which theory best explains why a social movement will develop? As a committee, design and consult, construct a website that will help popularize your movement. Your website should include use of a propaganda technique identified in this chapter. It also should include memorable logo, a theme, or a motto. It should be illustrated. It should emphasize the ide ideology of the movement. You should identify your propaganda technique within your group. Look for ways you could have used each of the techniques on your website. Each group should present its website as a website are presented, write down which type you think has been used, and vote as a class on which technique is being used for each propaganda technique. So here we go. These Here's our uh, definitions of our propaganda techniques. Testimonial uses endorsements by famous people to secure support for social movement. The goal is to persuade people to transfer their admiration for a celebrity to the social movement. The transfer is an attempt to associate the social movement with something that the public approves of or respects, such as patriotic symbols. So the testimonial would be like an advertisement by a celebrity for your thing. Uh, the, however, the transfer would be like the, uh, you know, American flag on Chevy trucks, that kind of thing. Uh, bandwagon appeals to the public interest or public's desire to conform by promoting social movement as already very popular with the public. Um, and so here again, this is the idea that every, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, how large a percentage of people support our particular idea. Uh, name calling. Uh, is where we use negative labels or images in order to make opponents in the social movement appear to unfavorable light. Um, uh, name calling is used oftentimes in politics where, you know, they uh, might refer to somebody as having been a draft dodger or something like that. Uh, plain folks appeal is that we talk about uh, the appeal of person is coming from the average American and his, uh, in the past, they came up from a working family. Uh, glittering generality is when we use uh, words that sound positive, but have little real meaning. And this technique paints the social movement in a positive light, but provides little real information, like the whole idea of make America first, that kind of thing. It doesn't really say anything, but it sounds good. Uh, uh, card stacking presents facts in a way that puts the social movement in favorable light. For example, it presents statistics or survey results in a way that favors social movements over its opponents. So what did you learn from this lab? As a group, you're going to discuss the following. How successful was a class at determining which propaganda technique to use? How successful was a class at using different propaganda techniques? Were some te techniques e easier or harder to use? And what types of propaganda do some modern social movements use? And that concludes our uh, study of chapter 17. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and we look forward with for our last chapter, chapter 18, next time.